works will be displayed. So Jesus comes to the man in verse 6. After he said these things, what does Jesus do? Obviously, he spits on the ground. <laughs> Just what Jesus, we would expect of Jesus to do. He spits on the ground, makes the mud from the saliva, and spread the mud on his eyes. This man who had been born blind, who had been assumed unclean his whole life, now has somebody's spit on his face. Dirt on his face. In English, we would say Jesus, it seems now, is adding insult to injury. Jesus, what in the world is mud going to do? Friend, it's not about the mud. It's not about the means. It's about Jesus. The mud is not going to heal the man's eyes. The spit is not going to heal the man's eyes. Jesus is going to heal the man's eyes. Amen. Jesus doesn't have to be in the room. Jesus doesn't have to be in that city. Jesus is going to heal the man's eyes, and he's going to take the light and spit it on the ground, taking a little mud and saying, okay, dab, 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 dab. Now go to the pool of Siloam and wash it off. As simple as it sounds, as inexplicable as it sounds, that's all Jesus is asking him to do. A couple of things of note. The pool of Siloam was a fresh spring, meaning that it always had fresh water coming into it, meaning that it was ritually clean. It could be used for ritual washing. So Jesus is letting him follow protocol in washing off the mud. Not only that, but it was also very close to the temple in Jerusalem, meaning as soon as he did this, he was able to go present himself to the religious leaders and to allow them to inspect him to, so that they could then see that he was blind now and that he was allowed in the temple. The man who had been ostracized his entire life because Jesus put some mud on his face and had him washed is now accepted, is now brought in where he had only been pushed out. And I also find it interesting with the pool of Siloam, you might remember that the only other time we see Siloam mentioned in the Gospels is this idea of the Tower of Siloam. During the time of Jesus, folks had been building this huge tower, a catastrophe had struck, the tower had actually fallen over onto like 55 people, if I remember correctly, something in that neighborhood. And so the question was obviously not well, I wonder what architectural design was wrong with this. The question was not, I wonder what the weight was of these things. It was, what did those people do that brought God's punishment on them? And Jesus tells us also that in that case, they were no more sinful than anybody else. Just like here, the man is no more sinful than anybody else. So closely tied with the Tower of Siloam, the Pool of Siloam, Jesus is striking these together and saying, look, punishment came on these people. At least it seemed like punishment, but it actually wasn't. God is doing a work. And in the pool of Siloam, this man goes and washes his face. He is now clean. He is now clean. He is now able to join society. And for the first time in his life, he's got functioning eyes. For the first time in his life, his brain is able to process memories, to take in visual things, to see mountains, to see valleys, to see buildings, to see people, to see their faces where he had only heard their voices. Mm. It's a brand new experience for him. And I am sure beyond a shadow of a doubt, it was overwhelmingly joyful for him. All of this is happening at the same time. Jesus tells us that he is doing all this because he is the light of the world. Amen. Later on, during the Sermon on the Mount, he will remind us that the eyes are the lamp of the body. Mm. That when light comes in, it gives light to the whole body. And then this is a spiritual teaching that he is giving us. And so when there is darkness and when there is lack of vision for somebody to see, particularly God's truth, their whole body is dark. Mm. Jesus is saying that in the same way your light, light comes into your body by your eyes. Jesus is the very light of the world. Amen. 
He is the very one by whom we see all things. He is the very one by whom we are able to understand and able to make sense of all that is happening in our world. He himself is that light. So in verse 7, we see that Jesus tells him to go, wash in the pool of Siloam, meaning he sent. So he left, washed, and what? Came back seeing. If you're ever reading through your Bible and just getting through it as fast as possible, let me ask you to pause to understand. This man who was born blind came back seeing. And so this is where Jesus, we don't see him much for a while in the story. He kind of slips out. He does his thing, makes some stuff happen, and then he comes, he goes, and he'll come back later. But what happens? The dude comes back. Jesus is not there anymore. He's only ever heard Jesus' voice, and that for a brief moment. So now all of a sudden, this huge interrogation starts to happen. And this is where sections two and three today are going to come in. First, we're going to see that this man is a question a little bit but more importantly, his parents. And then secondly, he in particular is going to be questioned himself. So after having seen verses 1 through 12, where Jesus heals the man of his physical blindness, we see that everyone is going to try to start making sense of what happened. They start asking questions. Verse verse 10 uh, verse 8, his neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said, no. Yeah, he's the one. Others say, no, no, no. He just looks like it. He kept saying, I'm the one. Of his own accord, he was not able to give a verified statement that people could believe. Remember, in Jewish Old Testament legal understandings, you have to have how many witnesses? At least two. He's one, so he cannot say, I was able to do this on my, or I'm able to verify them myself, because anybody can make that up. So now we have to bring other people into the stories. He kept saying, I'm the one. So they asked him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus. They mud, spread it on my eyes, told me, go to Salome and wash. So when I went and washed, I received my sight. Where is he, they asked. I don't know, he said. All very factual. This all sets the stage. So here we have this big to-do, this big interrogation. They brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. The day that Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. Then the Pharisees asked him again how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, he told them. I washed, and I could see. Quite simple. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a sinful man perform such signs? And there is a division among them. Within Old Testament, not Old Testament, within Jewish religious understanding of the day, interpretation of this, this type, there are two different schools. Okay, There was the school of Shammai, and there was the school of Hillel. And they went about these things quite differently in understanding how things happened. The school of Shammai would come at things and say, we have our theological understanding of the, of, what's, of the world. God doesn't listen to sinners. The Sabbath is holy. We're to keep the Sabbath. Therefore, anything that happens on the Sabbath, apart from God, has to be of the devil. This is my theological understanding. This is how I see the world. Now I'm going to take all of the facts of the happening and try to make sense of the facts based up off of my theological understanding of things. That's Shemai. You also have Hillel. Hillel says, what are the facts? What actually happened? Let's, in accordance, the us see all this. Kind of like Sherlock Holmes, if you've ever read any of those mystery novels. What actually happened? Taking all this together, now we have a basis, and now we can try to make sense of all that happened. But the thing that we have to keep in mind with both of these schools of thought is both of those who start with their predispositions, their assumptions, those who start with the facts is neither one of these folks were there. They're all going off of hearsay. They're all going off of witnesses. They're all going off of what they've understood, having not been there. 
So as we continue, we need to see how they're going to go about this. Verse 11, or verse 17, sorry, verse 17. Again, they asked the blind man, what do you say about it since he opened your eyes? He's a prophet, he said. So now we know this blind man is saying, Jesus is the one, and he thinks Jesus might be a prophet, and he healed me. So that's, that's what he knows at this point. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe this about him, that he was blind and received sight, until they summoned the parents of the one who had received sight. Because obviously they were going to be able to tell them if he had actually been born blind. Mom and dad are right there, two witnesses, good to go. We can verify that this actually happened. Verse 19, they asked him, is this your son, the one you say was born blind? How then does he see? That's two questions, in case you're keeping track. They were going to ask one question, now they're asking two questions. Is this your son? That's what they need to know. Factually, they can answer that question. How then does he now see? How are they going to answer that? Here we go. Verse 20, we know this is our son and that he was born blind. Nailed it. Good job. His parents answered. But we don't know how he now sees. And we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews, since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him as the Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Now, I don't know about you, but I read this story, and this is the part where my heart sinks the furthest. Is that for me? Thank you. <laughs> this is where my heart sinks the furthest. Because we already know this man has been born blind. We already know that he has been put out. My wife thinks I need a tissue. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop sniffling. Yeah, yeah, blind spots, blind spots. <laughs> there they are. We already know this man was born blind. We already know that he's not allowed in the temple. We already know that he is ostracized from society. And here we find out that he's a beggar, right? We've already found, we found out that he's a beggar. And then his parents step in. So not only is he ostracized from society and from religious life, his own parents wanted nothing to do with him. His own parents left him destitute to beg from society. And now these very parents who had left him destitute are brought in to testify about what had just happened. And I don't know about you, but I can imagine the blind man going, why him? I'd rather not see them today. And yet here we are. The only people able to verify that he was actually born blind are probably the last people that he wanted to see, knowing that they had been part of his ostracization and him being pushed out for his entire life. And their reaction is very telling. I don't think very highly of these parents, just so you know. <laughs> their reaction is very telling. Not only do they ostracize and leave their own son destitute, but when it came time to being questioned, they give as small an answer as possible. We know this is our son. Fair enough. Now he was born blind. But we don't know how, how he now sees. Verse 22. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews. Fear drives people to do some pretty crazy things. Fear might drive you to do some pretty crazy things. Be compassionate. I'm like, I'm not right. <laughs> Since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him as the Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Remember, they're coming with their theological understanding of how the world works. They're imposing it onto this man's story. And the entire culture is now being defined by this theological understanding, and it's not a great one. Remember, we've already seen some false dichotomies. We've already seen how people are seeing the world poorly. And so his parents are asked. His parents verify that who he is. His parents verify that they have not been a part of his life. In essence, they have shamed him his whole life. And they're the ones who can verify that this miracle actually happened. And in the church world, I wonder, just for a brief moment, if sometimes we come at life with our theological understandings as poorly as they are, and we impose them on our situation, and then, then have to 
untangle and unweave and get out all the knots from our understanding of who Jesus is, as opposed to coming at from the facts. This is what happened. This is what the text says. This is who we are. This is who we should be. We bring so much misunderstanding to the scripture, to our walk with Christ. If we would just let his own words wash over us, if we would just let his own words correct us, if we would just let his own words have their way with us, church, where would we be? Follow the text. Follow his words. So we see that the parents were brought in and questioned in verses 13 through 23, and now in verse 24 through 34, we're going to see this guy is now being questioned a second time because, remember, it's been verified. He was born blind. Oh, no, he's not now. What are we going to do with this? Verse 24. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind and told him, second time, remember, give glory to God, which is their way of saying, be honest. Their way of saying, there are consequences if you lie. They are putting him under oath. This is a phrase from the Old Testament. Whenever Achan had um, buried some things right after the the Exodus, and there was sin in the camp, and there was destruction happening, Mm. the Jewish leaders came to Achan and said, give glory to God, which is their way of saying, God knows. He's already fully aware. Own up to it. So they say, give glory to God in verse 24. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I can see. Again, listen to what he is actually (laughs) saying. This is, in one sense, both a very beautiful testimony. He is sticking to what he knows. He was blind, and now he sees. Jesus had done an amazing work in him. At the same time, they ask, Jesus, we know he's a sinner. And his response is, I don't know if Jesus is a sinner or not. I'm not sure. I know I was blind. I know I can see. His physical sight had been restored. Glory to God. Praise his name. And yet he has not yet seen Jesus for who he is. God himself had done a miracle in this man's life that no one could explain, that no one could make sense of, that completely shattered their world, and yet he had not seen Jesus for who he is. Friend, hold off thinking that because God's goodness has come to your life, that the miracle has happened, that it is because that you know Jesus. Maybe it's happening for Jesus' sake and his glory alone. Until you have seen him. Verse 27. I already told you, he said. You didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? I feel like he's mocking them a little bit. I don't know about you. Maybe that's just me. I'm just reading myself into the text. Verse 28. They ridiculed him. You're the man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's coming from. Verse 30, this is an amazing thing, the man told them. You don't know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him throughout history. No one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person more blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. Verse 34, you were born Entirely in sin, they replied. You're, you are trying to teach us. Then they mm. threw him out. Amen. Which is the technical way of saying he's ostracizing him. He is technically no longer allowed in the temple after having been in there, what, a couple of hours his whole life? Back to square one. He doesn't know who Jesus is, he knows Jesus healed him. He knows that he was blind, and now he can see. He knows that this is a miraculous thing. He knows that he has been shunned his whole life. And for a brief and passing moment, he was allowed back in to his cultural circles. Mm. 
And now, because of what he has just said, he's only knows again. He knows certain things. The Pharisees know certain things. Everybody knows things. And then in verse 35, Jesus comes back. In verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out. And when he had found him, he asked a very interesting question. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Not, were you blind? Not, how is it seen for the first time in your entire life? Not, how are you doing with this? Is the ground a little further away than you thought? Closer than you thought? Walls closer than you thought? What's going on here? Are you okay? You need some help? You want to know where the bread store is? We can do that for you. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He gets right to the point. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And if you're taking notes, please write down the phrase, Son of Man. Do it a study for yourself this week of the book of Daniel and other places in the Old Testament and the Gospels, where Son of Man is referenced. Jesus is not saying Son of Man like as in physical son of a person, just a normal, everyday human being. It is quite the opposite. Mm. The Son of Man in the Old Testament is a glorious, splendor-filled being who only briefly comes in the book of Daniel and is the one in whom the Israelites of the day had penned their hopes for restoration. He is the one they have been waiting for. He is the one that they had unequivocally wanted to come and restore them as a people. He is the one they have waited for for generations. Redeemer. Jesus is asking, do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe that God can do what he has said he will do? Verse 36, who is he, sir? He calls him sir because he doesn't realize it's Jesus yet. <laughs> that I may believe in him, he asked. Verse 37, Jesus answered, you have seen him. Congratulations on the First day of your entire life with functioning eyes. You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. The very first day he opens his eyes is the day that he sees Jesus. The first day. He opens his eyes. The day, excuse me, is the day he sees Jesus. Friends, his response in verse 38. I believe, Lord, he said, and he did what? He worshipped. His eyes had been opened for the first time his entire life. He had no visual memory as an adult. He didn't know what anything looked like. And Jesus comes, opens his eyes, completely changes his whole world. He is healed. A miracle has come. He is questioned up and down. His parents come. They are questioned up and down. What has happened? And they don't know how to make sense of it. And then, right here, right here, Jesus re-enters the scene and says, Do you believe I am who I say that I am? I am the Son of Man. If first time, it is his whole life. His eyes are actually now open. And he can see Jesus for who he is. And his heart 
is filled with awe and wonder. Mm. It wasn't whenever his eyes were physically opened. It was when his heart was open to who Jesus is. Friend, at the name of Jesus, if your heart is not filled with awe and wonder, if the name of Jesus doesn't flood your heart with goodness, do you know him, or are you still spiritually blind, walking around with fully functioning eyes that can see the world and make sense of things with your presuppositions and your assumptions of how the world works, able to take in data, able to take in facts, able to learn, able to see things, able to hear things, able to know things. But until you see Jesus for who he is, then your heart is still dead in your trespasses and sins. Your heart of stone is still there until you see Jesus for who he is. God of love, a God of wonder, a God of goodness, a God of wrath, a God who will one day rule with surety like we have yet to know. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him as he has presented himself in this earth? Do you know him as he has presented himself, as his spirit moves in his world to enliven his people to his gospel? Do you know that you, on your own, are dead in your trespasses, sins, iniquities? Without him, you are lost. It is only him as he seeks you, as he finds you, as he enlivens your heart to this message of who he actually is. You are lost. Friend, seek him while he may be found. Just as he is seeking you. Is your heart stir for these things. Verse 37 again, Jesus answered, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, he said, and he worshipped him. Verse 39, Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see, and those who do see will become blind. <clears throat> so the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, We aren't blind too, are we? If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. <coughs> there are those who think they can see, and yet they don't see Jesus. And so they don't truly there are those who walk around seemingly blind, or having been blind from birth, and once they see Jesus, they truly see him. Until you see the world as Jesus sees the world, until you see the world as it is his, until you see yourself as his and his alone, you don't truly see the world. No. Back to John Newton. Slave trader, turned pastor. He's actually not known for being a slave trader. He's actually not known for being a pastor. He's actually known for being a songwriter. He's actually known for a song that he wrote shortly after his conversion. Amazing grace. And the first verse goes like this: Amazing grace. Sweet the sound, saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, and now I'm found. Was blind. Now I see. John Newton, who ended his life here, blind and feeble, fighting for a cause, fighting for those who are destitute, 
preaching the gospel. We're going to take a moment.